Hey guys, it's Adam from Mr. Pixel, and welcome back. Now, if you look back at some of my content, in fact, a lot of my content, being my art talks, one of the things you might notice is that I, more often than not, focus on my failure rather than focus on my success. And there's multiple reasons for this. One of the reasons is because we tend to be too hard on ourselves. We tend to think that because we work alone most of the time and we're locked up on our little studio space and our little creative endeavors, that we can very easily fall victim to thinking that everybody out there is amazing and I'm one of the only ones who suck. Furthermore, you can feel like you're on the bottom of the barrel. You can think in terms of levels of skill, the elite, the great, the mediocre, the below average, and then the garbage. And for 99% of us, we will usually quite modestly put ourselves in the garbage category, right? Myself included. But there is another reason for this. There's another reason why I emphasize failure. It's because I have redefined my relationship with what failure is, what it represents to me and what kind of a force it plays in my life. It used to be a force that exhausted me. Failure used to be a source that weighed me down, that filled me with doubt, that clouded my judgment. And since then, through all of my experiences, particularly once I felt a bit of success in my life and could look back at all of these quote failures in retrospect, I came to realize that the failures that I had endured throughout my career, personal life included, right? Failures or failures in general were actually the reason why I succeeded in the first place. And I started to, instead of come to terms with and quote, accept my failures, I started to wear them on my sleeve like a badge of honor, a rite of passage, so to speak. And through analyzing my failures, if you can call it failures, I don't call it failures, but if we can call it failures, if we're going to be black and white about this conversation, then um, it was through studying that, it was through really analyzing how these different kicks in the ass forged my career, I started to better understand and develop a much greater perspective on myself, on who I was as a person and as an artist and as a professional. And it was through that understanding that I truly started to grow in a much more focused way. So the first thing that I feel that my failures have taught me is as the expression goes in art, it taught me to murder my babies. Hopefully I don't get flagged on YouTube for saying baby murder. <laughs> um, we'll see, <laughs> but um, it taught me to murder my babies. And if you're not familiar with that expression, it essentially means letting go of the things that you hold most precious because it's very often this illusion of preciousness that holds you back from growth. It holds you back from seeing, quote, the big picture about your art. This is a term used in drawing all the time. You can get so hyper-focused on the details of something that you, you don't stand back and look at your creation, your image as a whole. So even though you've noodled around in these this tight little area working out these details, when you zoom back, the image has not necessarily improved as a whole. And when you learn to let go of this, you stop, you stop carefully sewing around with fine thread around little mistakes. Instead, you can make much bolder, more confident changes that help to push your artwork forward much more efficiently, help you to make changes that are much more substantial and help you to focus your priorities in the right place. The exact same thing applies to you. The exact same thing applies to your artistic career. And I'll give you a good example of this. I grew up, as I've mentioned time and time again on my channel, I grew up from a very young age, I'd say from 
probably from the age 10, 11 onward, which is really, really young. Um, I grew up with this dream of being a, quote, Disney artist. I was completely enamored by Disney art, Beauty and the Beast and Tarzan and Aladdin and all of these films. I was so, I was so connected to it and I was so in love with Disney art that I really developed this single-minded obsession to become a, quote, Disney artist. Um, and I had this, it's, it's very interesting. I've always kind of had this tendency, which you probably, you probably will relate to as well. I'm sure that you can relate to this. When you feel a passion for something, when you're, when your heart connects to something that you do, you don't really question whether or not it's ever going to happen. You kind of know it will. And it's just a question of time and effort and focus until you eventually get it. And I, with a single-minded focus, pursued an art career and an art education with the single-minded focus of becoming a, quote, Disney artist. This affected my school choices. This affected the type of artwork that I produced, as it might very well influence yours. Maybe your, maybe your influence is John Kay, John Crick Falusi, who did Ren and Stimpy. Maybe your influence is Chuck Jones, who did Looney Tunes. Maybe it's Milt Call. Maybe it's Fritz Freeling. Maybe it's Rebecca Sugar. Maybe it's one of these, maybe it's one of these artists. And you become so seduced by and influenced by this, that this very much defines you growing up as it did for me. And then, as I mentioned many times in the past, that I got my education. I was ready for the market and I got my first job working as an animator, which of course was nothing close to being a Disney artist. I was doing, I did uh, key, key poses and key animation for a 3D CD-ROM game for a company called Lotto Quebec who do like all the gambling shit for, for Quebec, essentially. They employ a lot of people because they got a lot of money. And I did that kind of stuff. And I had fun, whatever. But I still had this focus. I'm still going to be a Disney artist. And then 2D Studios just started to belly up and there was no work available at all. And I realized very early on in my career that I got a very big heartbreak very early on in my career. I ain't going to get a job. And if I do get a job, it's going to be very entry level. I'm going to be at the bottom of the barrel and it's probably going to take me a very long time to get it. And like most adults like most people growing up i wanted independence i wanted to be able to get my own place move in with my partner and and be able to provide for myself so this dream immediately it's the moment i went i'm ready to go it's like it's like the the green light goes off and everybody falls on their face it's like it was i remember watching this one video where you know the green light goes off for these cyclists and the door that blocks the bicycles that prevents the bicycles from from going didn't quite open and all all eight of the cyclists just went flying over the handlebars of their thing that's what my career felt like i felt like i i i was full of energy it took me like 20 years of my life to go 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 and green light and i fall on my face that's literally what it felt like and that was the first time my career kicked me in the ass it said oh you've got dreams and aspirations Oh, that's so sweet. And then Mother Nature elbows me and I go flying off my bike. That's basically what happened. No pity, no remorse, no conscience, just deal with it. And I, at the time, felt completely defeated by that because I had put so many of my eggs in this one single basket that once somebody took that basket away from me, I felt I had lost all of my sense of direction. My sense of direction was far too linear. So I learned 3D. What else am I going to do? It's either that or go back to school and get a degree in accountancy, which ain't going to happen. So <laughs> I decided to learn 3D, the next best thing, I guess, right? And, you know, it served its purpose. And yeah, it did get me jobs. And yeah, it did end up getting me opportunities as a director. And all that's great. You know, gave me opportunities to work in big games and big studios and and that's all great but I wasn't emotionally fulfilled doing this kind of stuff directing was okay it's fine whatever but like it wasn't me it wasn't like it wasn't the the capital a Adam who grew up being this 
aspiring artist. It wasn't my foundation. It wasn't my core. It was just a job. But that's that was a lesson. At the time when it happened, I felt like it was a kick in the ass. At the time, I felt like my dreams had evaporated in front of my eyes before I even got a chance to realize them. But what it was teaching me was, no, life is a fight. And if you know anything about street fighting versus choreographed or not choreographed, but like, you know, MMA fighting, it's a different type of, it's a different type of psychology. When you're in the ring with a professional, there's professional rules, there's professional etiquette. You know, there, there's, there's a referee. But when you're on the street and somebody starts flailing at you with wild arms, those rules fly right out the window and you have to learn adaptation skills. You have to learn how to be versatile. You have to learn how to be flexible. You have to learn how to adapt more than plan out your fight. In fact, planning is planning in a street fight is usually considered a bad idea. So my quote plan, my strategic attack completely failed as soon as life started to throw flailing punches at me. And I was like, oh, I went into panic mode and I didn't know how to react to that kind of stuff. So I adapted. I learned adaptability and I learned that, hey, being a one trick pony is, might not necessarily serve it. But I was also learning something else. I was learning something against my will. And that's the fact that diversifying your skills, even if you have a singular focus in terms of your end goal, which is something I strongly advocate for, you need to be able to apply. You need to at least have the courage and the freedom of mind to apply a lot of different skill sets to your core skill. I've mentioned this in talks in the past. It's something I quote all the time from the movie Last Samurai. When Tom Cruise is starting to warm up to the samurai culture because he's he's trapped. The, the mountain pass has been blocked off by snow, so he's stuck with these guys. And he's walking through and he starts to pay attention to the lifestyle and he realizes how everything that they do, be it agriculture, love, architecture, fighting, philosophy, all of these different things tie into one single core, the art of war, the art of fighting. But everything feeds into that. And I realized 3D, as reluctant as I was, as much as I felt forced to make change, as the expression goes, true change doesn't happen until you're on the brink, that I adopted this new skill. I adopted a new skill that I realized in the long run would help me to reach out to different communities, help me to reach out to different career opportunities, help me to implement principles, techniques into 2D art that I never even would have fathomed had I just been a one trick pony 2D artist. And I am for gr forever grateful for the lighting and fabric and particle effects and uh, uh, camera lenses and all of these and camera movements and all of these different things that I learned through 3D and through other people who knew 3D who educated my 3D work and I went oh I learned this about camera moves don't go too crazy with your camera moves how to focus how to get the eye level of your camera to match up with the focal point of your thing and what kind of lenses to use in different types of situations are we going to use ultra wide or telephoto or standard standard lens. I started to learn all this kind of stuff back then. Now, fast forward later on in my career, other times I got my ass handed to me where I did get jobs in 2D art and I was working at a decent sized game studio, working as a concept artist and illustrator. And one of my directors, one of my direct superiors who I worked right next to, his desk was right next to mine, literally ripped off my work right in front of my face in front of their clients and I'm sitting there going you out of your damn mind what are you talking about that's your work that's he, he sat down at a table and he says yeah these are some of the concepts I did for for this game and I went I beg your pardon you never touched those, those are that's 100% my work what the hell are you talking about he wasn't even directing that project he just was the one presenting the info he took full credit for it and I said that's not my work that's not your work that's mine and he looks at me and goes, Adam, if there's a problem, you can leave the room. He knew damn well what he was doing. And he knew he had the support of the other douchebags who, who he worked with. It was like, a, it was a boys club. Everybody was kind of, they made this little click. They all smoked cigars on their lunch break together. I'm not getting in on that. And what happened to me there? Well, I took it to HR, to human resources. And I said, listen, 
this guy's stealing my work. And I knew I know it wasn't HR's first time ever hearing this because I found out after the fact that um, he'd done this to everybody in the studio. He, was, he stole people's work all the time. Now, long story short, po if you want to talk poetic justice, this guy hasn't found a decent job in the last 20 years. So good riddance to bad rubbish. What goes around comes around. But at the time, I felt really screwed over. So I took it to HR. And HR, she looked at me in the eyes with her pretty blue eyes and she put her hand on my shoulder and she said, Adam, you did the right thing. I appreciate you coming to me. I really do. We'll do something about it right away. That's not right. And I said, thank you. I'm really grateful I have somebody's support here because I'm kind of, I'm feeling in a bit of an anxiety attack. What the hell is going on? <laughs> why are people stealing my work? That's, why is that necessary? She goes, no, Adam, you really, honestly, you did the right thing. You didn't confront him personally. You came and spoke to me about it. I said, great, awesome. Next day I was fired. In fact, she fired me. She said, sorry, we gotta let you go. I went, wow, holy smokes. <laughs> And I walked out of there feeling betrayed. I walked out of there feeling, well, I put you put your heart and soul into something, and then think about think about it like a relationship. You put your heart and soul into something, into a into a relationship. A job is a can be a relationship, depending on what you put into it. Since I was so young too, I really, really had my emotions tied into what I was doing, in a in a very substantial way. This was my life. I didn't have kids and all this other stuff that I was worrying about. It was just my job. And I just got cheated on. Not only did it's kind of like the feeling of not only catching your partner in bed with somebody else, but then you saying, but you just told me that I was the only one in your life and your partner turning to you and going, I have no idea what you're talking about. I've never said that before in my life. And, and you go, wow, wow. Was I taken for granted? Now, how did that make me feel? Well, number one, it taught me that it taught me to pick my fights. It really did because I've been in studios before where, you know, I I'm some entry level guy who walks into a studio and I can see that there's shit ain't working right properly, that people aren't treating each other. Well, there's a lot of back talk. There's a lot of, there's a, a mutinies on its way. I can see that the other uh, lead artists are completely falling to shit. I can see that man management is way too top heavy, meaning there's too much management and everybody's fighting. Everybody's fighting to manage projects and stuff like that. I've seen these, I, I, I would be in this kind of situation and I would want to fix it. And I've only been working in the studio for a couple of months. And you go and you bring it up with somebody. I realized that if you, if, if there's corruption in a studio and it's at a very high level, you're not, don't ever think for two seconds, you can walk into a studio like that and fix it. Like the expression goes, if the head of the fish stinks, throw out the fish, right? And the head of the fish really stunk in that studio. And I tried to make, I tried to change that. That was naivety. I'm not a C, I'm not the, I'm not the general manager of a studio. I don't have that kind of seniority. No, if you see something like that, what I learned is number one, it's a toxic environment. Get out. Number two, keep your mouth shut about it. You don't walk in like you don't walk in like you're some some cowboy slinging hero and you're going to go and fix the studio. That shit doesn't happen in real life. You don't walk in and go, you know, this is corrupt and we got to expose the corruption and wean out the bad eggs. No, if your boss rips you off, if your boss mistreats you, that's because he knows or she knows that they can. Period. They know they're getting away with it. Now, some people can be very secretive about it, but nine times out of 10, if your boss who's, wor in, who's working very closely with their boss is doing this and it's happened before, then they've got the support of their superior. If you make a complaint, it's your neck on the line, not theirs. And that's exactly what happened to me. So what did that teach me? It taught me a fundamental rule. It taught me a survival instinct. Be aware of your surroundings. Be aware of your situation, just like a fight, right? Uh, uh, you're not gonna, you don't wanna go running from a fight and find yourself in a dead end. That's exactly what happened. I, I ran from the fight, I went to HR, I told her about it and, and I found myself in a dead end. I cornered myself. Maybe I could have salvaged my, salvaged my job and maybe he would have ripped off my work for a couple more weeks or even months, but I could quietly find another job 
and then gently and very diplomatic di diplomatically say, thank you very much for the opportunity. I found other work. Thank you very much. Take care and walk out with my, with my chin up. But I didn't. I played the cowboy and I, I got shot in the foot. <laughs> what can I tell you? I learned a survival instinct. Keep your cards close to your chest. Pick your fights carefully. If there's something going on, instead of going and complaining to HR about it, look around. How does this person, how long has this person been in the studio for? What kind of power does this person have? What kind of weight does this person have? And assess the situation based on, off of that. And if you can see that they've got the support of the studio, if they've got the support of the studio, you're gonna lose your job, not them. Learn some street smarts, and I did. The next time, it, next time something like that came up where I found myself faced with a cutthroat, number one, I recognized the threat very, very quickly. I, I recognized it immediately. This guy's bad news, I can tell. He's going around talking to other people in different departments. I can see that he's got an animosity towards me. Maybe he feels there's some kind of competition. We're both kind of supervisors in this job. I can see that this person is reacting in a very defensive way towards me and I'm not even posing myself as a threat. He's his. I can see that his friendliness is very superficial and he, he keeps asking me personal questions, trying to get into my head, trying to find out what my intention is. He's planning an attack. And I just smile and say, I don't know. I just play dumb about it. But I'm also sitting there going, this guy's been in the studio for the last 12 years. You think in a million years, if I make a complaint about this guy, they're gonna sack him? That guy's responsible for five projects in the studio. If I say anything, it's my ass on the line. I learned that from my mistakes, from picking my fights poorly. So what did I do instead of that time? I played it out, I didn't say anything. I just, whenever whenever you ask personal questions about my life or about my work or whatever, I just said, I don't know, you let me know. And when the shit started to hit the fan, I just very gently just found myself something else and then I thank them very much for the opportunity I don't really feel I fit in here but I think you guys are wonderful and I really appreciate the opportunity but I've got another offer somewhere else so yeah thank you very much and take care I walked out without getting without being poisoned by the toxic environment I learned my mistakes and I didn't have to lift I didn't have to pull a single punch now could I have misjudged the situation I could have but I had enough experience through my mistakes in the past to be able to assess the situation as would you in any quote survival situation first time you panic you freak out you think i'm gonna do some uh, some 360 kick and, and knock the guy out and then the guy smacks you in the face and your whole strategy goes to the heck and you get your ass handed to you right that happens we all have to deal with punches this is how we get better this is how we learn how to be professionals is by understanding the fundamental rule about a fight if you're not walking into that fight ready and willing to get punched, then you're not ready for the fight. And the last point that I want to make, if you're going to if you're going to walk out of this with any takeaway, I want it to be this. What mistakes do is they chip away at your illusions. They chip away at your false impressions of what a true career is what it means to be a true professional, what it means to find your path. I grew up with the illusion of being a Disney artist. And when that Disney artist opportunity at the time didn't present itself, when, when, that, so when somebody just came in, when Mother Nature came in and said, nope, that's not gonna happen, find something else. And I was forced to walk away from that. It forced me down multiple different paths. It forced me down the path of 3D. It forced me down the path of flash animation. It forced me down the path of, of premiere and video editing. It forced me down the path of photography. It forced me down the path of videography and then learning about lenses and learning about lighting and learning about audio. It forced me down all of these different paths. Some of them being forced, some of them being, hey, I kind of like this, let's keep doing it. AKA my YouTube channel and what I do on my YouTube channel, video and photo. It forced me down these paths and I realized that it took every one of those unique skills for Disney <laughs> to recognize me and say, hey, would you like to supervise our animated show? And I went, I beg your pardon? I had at that point in my life given up 
on Disney. I realized that my life had moved on to other things and, and I found things in my life that I enjoyed more, that, I, that brought me more fulfillment, that brought me more artistic satisfaction, that brought me more career satisfaction, that gave me a better sense of purpose than just being another Disney guy, being another Disney animator. But then Disney said, hey, we love your mix of skills and all of these management opportunities that you've learned along the way. Would you like to work on our show? And my reaction wasn't, oh my God, my dream came true. My response was, yeah, I think that'd be a great opportunity. I didn't walk in as a fanboy. I walked in as a professional and I said, yeah, cool. I think that'd be a great opportunity. And it was a great opportunity. And in so many ways that working on that, on that show was a huge learning experience and it was uh, fun, but it wasn't entirely me anymore. Was it? Yeah. I mean, look at the artwork I do now. It's come a long way from being a Disney artist. And you can look back at the last 10, 12 years of my artwork on my channel. You can see the evolution that my art has taken to get to where I am today. It was, a great opportunity and I'll be forever grateful for the fact that I got to work on a Disney show. But it wasn't the be all end all. And when that opportunity came and went, I didn't fall flat on my face. I realized what a terrible position I would have been in if the only thing I was ever good at was Disney. And then if Disney rejected me and I lost the job, it would have been devastating to my integrity. It would have been devastating to my sense of self. But instead, it was a, well, shit. It didn't work out. But you know what? We've got these other opportunities. I ended up becoming a teacher. I ended up starting my own school. I ended up starting all this stuff and I'm loving my life. My life now is a, is, is my, my life is my greatest work of art. It is, a, it is an embodiment of everything that I love. Like Brad Bird said, I use every single part of the buffalo to produce, to be who I am as a professional. Who I am as a professional is not just a manifestation of all of these wonderful things I did better than everybody else. The success of my life, where it is now at least, is a manifestation of some of the wonderful successes that I've had in my life but it's, I'd feel even more so a manifestation of all of my screw ups and all of my failures. And every single time I got into the ring and got my ass kicked time and time again. And it forged me into truly knowing who I am at my core without the illusion of life, without the illusion of what I could be instead realizing who I truly was, even at my weakest, most vulnerable form. And it's that self that has followed me till today. It is that self that is a lesson that has proven to be the most reliable source of inspiration and guidance and focus in my career. And hopefully it will to you too. All right. So with that said, I love you all with all my heart and happy painting. Take care.